Can you say what the six languages are on page 19? What are they? Number one is what? What's the first language on page 19? Huh? Do you remember? What's the first language? Hausa. Hausa is also called Auza. I've heard that anyway from a Nigerian friend of mine at Princeton. So Hausa, Auza. And that is a language spoken where? In Nigeria, that's right. So this Nigeria, not only Nigeria, and other countries in the area, it has a very large number of speakers. And the second language is? Albanian. And Albanian is actually very easy to tell. Why? In fact, Polyglot 3000 gave you 100% certainty on Albanian. Did you notice? It was 100% sure. And you can be too. Why? Did you notice anything special about the writing? Louder, please. There is umlaut. Exactly. E umlaut. Now, we have an umlaut in German. We have it in Hungarian. We have two kinds of umlauts in Hungarian. But do either of these languages, maybe you don't know Hungarian, but for German or for the Scandinavian languages, O umlaut, A umlaut, is there E umlaut? There is no E umlaut in the familiar languages of West Europe. So if you see an E umlaut, you've, you're probably looking at Albanian. And do you know what that sound is? Why do they need to mark it? Pardon? Pardon? Exactly. You checked. That's great. The E umlaut is a schwa. It's a kind of schwa. And it's interesting because this kind of sound turns up in a number of languages here and there. For example, in some aboriginal languages of Taiwan. The E is actually a kind of schwa or a different kind of sound than you'd expect from A. And the third language is? Indonesian. It's Indonesian, very good. One answer that Polyglot 3000 gave was Malay. They are basically the same language. They have a few differences of vocabulary and spelling. But it is Indonesian, and I mentioned uh, on the post, at least in Facebook. Do you know of another way that you can check, even sometimes more accurately than the polyglot software, what a language is? Anybody think of a way to identify a language pretty easily and pretty accurately? Let's finish the last three and then we'll talk about it some more. Think of a way that you can identify a language quite easily and accurately. Four is Turkish, very good. Five is Somali. Somali spoken in Somalia, that's in northeastern Africa. And six is Croatian, right. And one guess it gives is Bosnian. And there is a difference, although they are very, very close. It's one of the major languages of the former Yugoslavia. <clears throat> one easy way to tell Serbian from Croatian and Bosnian, Bosnian is, anybody know anything about Serbian? You will see right away that it's different from Croatian if you're looking at the writing because Serbian is written in which kind of alphabet? Anybody know? Croatian is written in the Latin alphabet, right? You could see that. But Serbian is written in the Cyrillic alphabet. Cyrillic is the Russian alphabet. They speak basically the same language, but they're in different, they write in different alphabets. They have different religions. One is Orthodox, one is Catholic. And it's very similar to the situation with Hindi and Urdu. I'll mention this since we're on this language. Hindi you're probably familiar with, at least by name. Where's Hindi spoken? What part of India? Very good, northern India. Hindi is the major language. It's one of the official languages of India. The people in the south don't really have an interest in Hindi. 
because their languages are Davidian, totally unrelated to Hindi and the other languages of North India. Uh, almost the same language as Hindi is spoken in Pakistan. And it's similar, but you can also tell the difference right away by looking at the writing because, anybody know? Hindi is written in what's called the Devanagari alphabet. And that's typical Indian script. Actually, all of these scripts come from the same origin. They have the same origin as our own alphabet. People believe that the alphabet was only invented once. And as it went to different language areas, different cultures, they changed the alphabet to their own purposes. So it has the same origin as our own alphabet, as far as we know. But they use the Devanagari alphabet in Hindi, but in Urdu, what is the major religion of Pakistan? If you're following international news, you should certainly be aware of this. Islam, that's right. So what kind of script would you expect for Urdu? Arabic script. So they're basically the same language with some differences of vocabulary and other differences, but they mainly represent two countries and two religions. India is mainly Hindu although there are many Muslims. Pakistan is overwhelmingly Muslim. So there's a very, very similar situation. You've got two different religions marked by two different writing systems. Serbian is in Cyrillic, Russian Orthodox. Croat or Croatian is in the Latin alphabet and they're Roman Catholic. And the same Urdu is in Arabic script, they're Muslim. And Hindi is in Devanagari script and they are Hindu. So you will find that religion often plays a very important part in language and in writing systems. And I said that there was a method of finding a language or identifying a language quite accurately and very easily. Polyglot 3000 is pretty good, but sometimes it doesn't look very sure of itself, right? It says that the, its confidence rate is something like 30-some percent. And then you wonder, ah, are they right? It's only 30-some percent sure, 20-some percent. In these cases, it was correct. It isn't always correct. Can you think of a really easy way to identify language? What's, what's our, our constant companion when we're trying to find things on the internet? Google. If you just take a piece of text, and I think Google still only will do searches on 10 words or less. The maximum is 10 words. After 10 words, it just ignores everything you've put in there. If you just paste it into Google, where, will, where do you think you'll be taken? First of all, you'll be taken to this page. You found that, right? Yeah, you'll be taken back to this page because these, these news items, these samples were taken from the BBC. And I collected them. The BBC does not keep everything online that they've always posted, so it'll take you back to this site. But if you haven't put it in double quotes, remember sometimes you want to use double quotes to get an exact search phrase. You don't want it to add S, you don't want it to change the spelling, you want this exact phrase, and you don't want it to change the order. But if you don't use double quotes, and you put in about 10 words from the text, where will you be taken? Where will you be taken? This is how I confirmed the identity of Croatian. Where does it take you? You'll be taken to a lot of websites that end with HR. And that is the country code for Croatia. So for example, DNTW, those sites are based where? In Taiwan, obviously. Why don't we have DNUS? Actually, we do, but it's not very common. This is a really interesting illustration of marketness and language. Why do we not see many DNUS sites? You want to know if you have an American site, right? You're not going to see US in most cases. There is a US country code suffix, but it's not very common. How do we know that it's an American site, or how can we guess it's probably an American site? OK, that goes back to the idea of marketness. If I just say ro, what kind of ro am I talking about in Chinese? Which row are you thinking of? Pork, right? Everybody's thinking of pork. Because pork is unmarked. We don't have to say, unless we're really, really picky about pork, we're OK with everything but pork, then we might say 猪肉. But if we say, 这个菜里面有肉, 
we assume it's got pork in it. We don't have to say zhu, right? So we just assume ro means zhu, unless we say it's a tai li mian you niu ro. Some Taiwanese don't eat niu ro, right? We will say niu, we will say ji and other things, yang, but we don't have to say zhu because the unmarked interpretation of ro is zhu ro. It's unmarked, wu biao ji. 就是你没有加任何的形容词,你没有任何修饰, it just means pork. How about in English, meat? If I just say meat, what meat comes to mind? Beef. Because the, the unmarked meaning of meat in English is beef. I can remember from when I was very young, parents would say, eat your meat, and it was always beef, almost always beef. So that's the unmarked meaning of meat in English. It's different from in Chinese. Now, how does that relate to what I was asking about? Why do we not see many .us domains, country domains, country codes? Can you relate what I just said to what I'm asking? Jerome? The US is unmarked. Everything that's .com, .net, anything at all is probably based in the US. So there's a lot of people that use US domains that are not in the US. But anything in the US is not going to have a country code because it's like ro. <laughs> it's unmarked. 看到肉就是猪肉,看到没有标记,看到没有country code的时候就是美国, right? Okay, so the point is that if you input like 10 words or less from one of these texts, it will take you probably to where? We're talking about country codes now, we're back to country codes. It'll take you to the country where that language is spoken, right? So I just put in 10 words, all of the sites were HR, which is the country code for Croatia. And that's one way to check your work. You write it down, that's a method to find what a, what a language is. It's easier than downloading the software and then checking and then seeing it's not very confident. Just put in 10 words or less, Google will take you to the country where that language is spoken. You have to look at the majority of sites. There will always be exceptions. There are a lot of Chinese speakers living in the US, in, the, in Europe, in other places, in Africa. But if you keep being taken to a certain country, that's probably the language that you've input. All right, so that's an easier way to do it, a very simple way. Uh, simple in as far as Google is simple. It's not really simple at all, but it's simple for us to use. Uh, okay, your handwritten consonant allophone rules are due next time on Wednesday, this Wednesday. So make sure those are finished, writing out by hand all of the consonant allophone rules in the textbook pages 72 to 77. Um, we're going to go over the written and performance exercises for Chapter 3, which you will hand in on the 26th, 二十六号. You need to hand in two big things, have two things ready. One is the Prat assignment. Prat assignment is due on November 26th. And the exercises, both written and performance exercises for Chapter 3, are also due on November 26th. And assuming all goes well, we are going to have our chapter test on Chapter 3, on the 28th, on a Wednesday. There will also be a dictation. So the 26th, hand in plot, hand in the exercises, or have ready the exercises for chapter three, both written and performance. 28th is the chapter three chapter test. The syllabus is now up to date up through December 5th. So it wasn't up to date until yesterday. It is now up to date. So if you want to check all these dates, I posted them on Facebook last night and also the syllabus page is up to date. And in addition, another important point, we're going to start chapter five after we finish three, as I mentioned we might do. Because at the end, we are always rushed. We are always rushed. I will take responsibility for that, it's my fault. I take a lot of time at the beginning, I wanna ease people in, tell people lots of stories about related things. It sometimes helps because we save time later on, but it ends up that we spend a lot of time at the beginning and then we rush more and more as we go through the semester. On the one hand, it's human nature, and on the other hand, it's really me. So I will take responsibility for that. Um, but chapter five, after chapter three is done, so we should be starting that next time on Wednesday. We'll be starting chapter five. We will also do chapter four, but it may be more rushed. So anything that you can do on your own will help you and help everybody get through it a little faster. And we're going to finish chapter three today. We're going to try. I, I hope it will. 
work out that way. Uh, does anybody have any questions, any confusion about assignments when they're due, about the test? Anything in chapter three or previous to chapter three or outside of the textbook? Anybody need to ask anything at all? Because otherwise, we're just going to concentrate on getting through the text. Yes? .uk.co. Oh, I'm not sure. They, because they also have a base in the US, maybe. Right. I think when they don't have a country code, it's often because they have a, at least a site based in the US. I think that's the reason. But you can check online, I'm sure. Yeah, anything else? All right. Or maybe it's .co.uk, BBC. What is it in the US? COM.com, Because the ing was a dot co. Right, co.co. And that's one way they distinguish. And I remember somebody being unhappy about that. <laughs> Just an impression. <laughs> but that's the way it is. The internet started in the US, so they make the rules. They didn't need the codes at the time because they were the only ones. As other countries came in, they added their country codes to mark where the, co the website was based. Let's continue in chapter 3, page 68. Our next reader, please. Um, so, the force of the Chinese Communist Party is right. Do we have a bounty? Do, do I get really, really picky about Biao Ti? <laughs> it's not just me. I don't do it just to be a pain. Why, why am I so picky about Biao Ti? I told you like on the first day of class. Why am I so picky about section titles and headers? Very often we can be reading and reading and reading and then have a lot of information swimming in our head and we really don't know what the point is. We really don't know what the point is of the whole section. But that's one really good purpose of Biao Ti. They focus us immediately. They tell us what to pay attention to. We're suddenly reading about wu, ru, yu, lu. We might be talking about consonants in general, but we're not. We're talking about one class of consonants, namely approximants. They are a class of consonants. But they're also called semivowels, at least W and J are. So always please include the Biao Ti. It helps us all Focus our attention immediately so we'll get more out of what we read. Let's continue. Start again. Approximants. Right. The first approximants are Wurujo. Huh? The third one? Uh, Did you have KK yeah. before? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. L, S, N. And L. L. Yeah. S or L. You can just say L. L. Mm hmm. As in wag, rag, yag, lack. Let's just stop there a minute. How would you read the first one based on the spelling? You may not know this word. It means to whack. It means to hit something hard. To whack. He gave him a big whack. Or it landed on the table with a whack. How would we pronounce it based on the spelling? How? Huh? Whack, but with traditional Taiwan English training, it would be whack, right? Whack. A lot of people don't use the voiceless w sound. I don't, although many people do. Uh, on page 69, he's going to mention that even people who still have the hu sound don't use it for all words. That's not really true in my experience. There are people who use the hu sound very consistently, very, very consistently. It's part of their native dialect. And there are lots and lots of them. I, for years, have told my students, drop it. And I still do, because I don't have it. But the majority, although they speak, say, wu, a very large minority, large groups of people say hu. So just keep that in mind. Hu is still very common. In American English, there are areas usually or sometimes There are still lots of people who use hu. And they use it a lot in the news. The news tends to use more standard conservative pronunciations in Taiwan as well. Do you talk like a newscaster in Taiwan? 你讲话很像那个那个主播吗? 
No, you would sound pretty weird if you did, right? So also in America, we've got, in English speaking countries, we've got many different kinds of pronunciation. Some have hu. It's quite common in the news. Um, okay, so in theory it would be whack, but here it's whack because they've written W. Go on. The first three of these sounds are central approximate. Approx. Approximate. Right. And the last is the is a lateral approximate. All right. Watch your stress. Do we have repetition? Mm -hmm. The first three of these sounds are. Do we have repetition? So when we have repetition, what do we do? De-stress. We don't stress it. And if I say the first three of these sounds are central approximants, what information have I given you? Jamie? Central is important. And in addition, if I say central approximants, what are you expecting? Something contrasting to central, exactly, exactly. So I've already told you through my intonation that approximance is going to be repeated very, very soon. Or even if I don't repeat the word approximance, it'll be a word that's similar in meaning to approximance. So the first three of these sounds are central approximants, and the last is a lateral one or lateral sound or something. I could use a different word, and the stress, the intonation would still be the same. Go ahead. The articulation of... Mm -mm, I want to hear it correct. The first three of these sounds are central approximants, and the last is a lateral approximant. Good. The articulation of... Articu... Articulation of each of them. Each of them. Each of them. Okay, everybody, please remember that as a chunk, because of them. I guess the time means right? At least them is. Each of them. Each of them. Everyone, each of them. If you say each of them, what are we doing? Okay, I'm sorry we're spending time on this now, but this will help you in chapter five when we're going to be talking about things like this. If you say each of them, what am I implying? Sorry? Amy? Um, You look like you've got the right idea, so <laughs> just find the words and you'll be fine. <laughs> Each of them, that means I wasn't expecting us to be talking about them and I'm, I'm really contrasting them with somebody else, some other group. Each of them, no, no, each of those people there. Don't say yoga contrast. Them is a shutsu. So just remember each of them, each of them as a chunk. Unless you really want to emphasize it or contrast it, you shouldn't stress it, okay? Go ahead. The articulation of each of them very slightly, depending on the articulation of the following vowel. Good, I would say uh, on the articulation. On, on, depending the. on the articulation of the following vowel. The following vowel. The following Home is a vowel. right? You can feel that. Feel. Feel. Sorry, everybody, please watch this word because it so often comes out as Phil in Taiwan. Phil is strong mat. Feel. feel. Everyone, feel. feel. Feeling. Feeling. Feels. Feels. Good. How? You can feel that the tongue is, on, is in a different position in the first sounds of we and water. 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 Mm -hmm. The thing is. True for reap and raw, be and law. Law. I oh, sorry, raw. Law. Raw. The first one. Raw. Raw. Not raw. 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 Yeah. Li and law, and yi and ya. Try to feel where your tongue is in each of these words. Okay. Very good. Tongue. Tongue. Yeah. Good. Anybody know what yi and ya are? I think you know yi. Yi means. You, right? Niman. It's a plural. We don't use it anymore. And ya, ya hen te bie, gen ne ge hang xin yo guan. Chuan shang hui yong de ge zi. Look it up. This is an interesting word. You may have occasion to use it in the future. Let's go on. Oh, wait. Let's make sure that we know what they're talking about here. Um, these are the voiced approximants. All the approximants we've learned are voiced. At least normally they're voiced, or originally they're voiced. We know that sometimes they're voiceless when? 
When might you, for example, be the y and you be voiceless? When might the y in you or the l in play, for example, why is that voiceless? Comes, comes after a voiceless obstruent. Okay, so play. It becomes voiceless, cute, etc. So if we've got a voiceless obstruent in front of one of these sounds, those appro approximants will probably become voiceless as well. This is assimilation. Um, we can, uh, we're also talking about position of the tongue. So everybody say we and then compare it to water. Everybody, we. We. Water. water. Can you feel the different position of your tongue? We, for we, your tongue is more, it's higher and more, more front. It's higher and more front for we, water, it's more back and, and low. And then try again with reap and raw. Go ahead. Reap, raw. Lee, law. Can you feel the difference? It's very easy to see. If you look at your partner, the person sitting next to you, just look at your partner now. Sorry, you have to take off your mask for a minute. Okay, so uh, say Lee and law each other to each other separately. Can you see the difference in how their mouth looks? So for Lee, which, for which one is your mouth more closed? For Lee, right, because the tongue is higher. And finally, Yi Yaw. All right. Um, I'm going to summarize part of the next paragraph because we already know this stuff. It says that they can occur in consonant clusters. A cluster is a zi chuan. Zi yin chuan is a consonant cluster. Like, for example, pray. That's more than one consonant together in a row. So pray, PR, is a consonant cluster. Bray, tray, dre, and cray, gray, etc. All of these things, these are examples of words that start with a consonant cluster. And as we just said, all of these approximants tend to be voiceless, not not 100%, but normally, tong tong. All of these approximants are voiceless when they come after a voiceless obstruent. Um, okay. And if we want to show that a sound is voiceless and aspirated. What's the aspiration symbol? A small raised, small raised H, not just any old H, a small raised H. And if there is no immediately following vowel, so if there is no vowel coming right after it, we can put a little circle under it, and we've also had that in class before. So that shows voicelessness. Um, so it says that we can transcribe the words play twice clay by putting a little circle under the approximant. Okay, so when they, when they said when there's no immediately following vowel, I think they mean p, a, pay. P has an immediately following vowel, but with play it does not. There's an L between the initial stop and the vowel. And then in that case, it usually gets assimilated to the initial voiceless stop, and it becomes voiceless, a little circle. And in uh, consonant clusters like this occur in, occur in words like pew, q, and for British speakers, tune. But as I mentioned before, in most British dialects, as far as I know, they do not say tune. Tune sounds very, very... Um, Sounds very old-fashioned and very picky. Normally in British, you wouldn't say tune, you would say tune. There's still a U sound, but the T has become affricated. So you hear a ch, a sh sound. Because it's y, the S that would come normally after it is, it sounds like a sh sound. It becomes palatalized. So tune in most American speech Tune is possible when we're trying to be a little pedantic. Pedantic We might say tune. It sounds very funny to my ears. In British, usually we say tune. Tune. Uh, and then we'll talk about you later on because it's got a special status among the diphthongs. 
And the next part is about the difference between clear L, clear L and dark L. And I'm also going to sim, uh, summarize this very quickly. Clear L occurs where? What's its relative position in a word usually? Before a vowel, before a vowel. So pre-vocalic, a pre-vocalic L sound, L sound, is usually a clear L, especially in British English. In American English, all bets are off because we make lots of L's dark. We just darken L's all over the place. So in British English, it's a better example, a clearer example of clear L's before vowels is what you get before vowels. However, after a vowel, we get a dark vowel. In a clear L, what is the place of articulation? What is the place of articulation of a clear L? It's a lateral approximate, but we have contact. Which two articulators are in contact? Alice? Which two articulators? The alveolar ridge and the tip of the tongue, right. So the tip of the tongue is touching the alveolar ridge for a clear L, the L before vowels. However, after a vowel, an L is no longer a clear L, both in British and in American. It is called a dark L, that's right. And we can also call it a velarized L. It's velarized. Now why do we call it velarized in Chinese? We usually talk about the active articulator. The velum is the active or passive articulator. It's passive. We can't easily, we can move it a bit. There's a muscle in there. But normally we're moving our tongue to the velum rather than moving the velum to the tongue. Okay, we do, we do use the muscles in there to open or close the velic um, closure. But in, in any case, if an L comes after a vowel, it becomes velarized. In Chinese, they usually call it shugenhua because you're using the back of your tongue, it's going very close to your velum. For us, it would be better to say shi hou hua, because as I said in probably the first or second class, we don't like to say shi gun unless we mean a place very deep in the tongue that we don't usually refer to when we're talking about English. We talk about shi hou, it's the back of the tongue. So, so wei de zhong wen de shi gun hua, you can call shi hou hua. Or you can say ran e hua if you want to do it like English does. Velarization. So dark L is a velarized L. That means that the back of the tongue becomes quite tense and it will dome. 就是会鼓起来, 然后紧紧的, 就是舌后的那个区域,那个地方, uh, uh. And the way we get there, if you're not sure how to get there, is use an exaggerated Beijing pronunciation of e. Uh. In Chinese, in Taiwan, you can just say du zi uh. Uh, there's nothing going on much with the tongue. But in Beijing, you can say uh, right? So make it very, very exaggerated. Uh, uh, everyone? There we go. Can you feel the back of your tongue getting tense? Uh, do you feel it? Yes or no? That's what you need to make a dark L. So really, all a dark L is is a very exaggerated. Uh, uh, uh. There we've got a dark L. When we are making a dark L, is it still an alveolar sound? Do we have alveolar contact? Does the tip of the tongue still touch the alveolar ridge? All right, this is something you need to know because it may or it may not. Either way is okay. So bill is okay. I don't usually say it with alveolar contact, but I could. There's nothing wrong with it. Bill. Hey, look, there's bill. A little odd, but I can do it, and it's not wrong. Normally, I don't have alveolar contact for a dark L. This might be in a test, so pay attention, okay? So, a dark L is a post-vocalic L. We can also call it a, what kind of L? Velarized L. In Chinese, we would probably call it? Shugenhua or shihouhua. Let's call it shihouhua to be more consistent and more accurate. That means the back of the tongue domes and becomes tense. It gets closer to the velum. Ooh, ooh, bill, bill. And usually there is no alveolar contact. Remember that we talked recently about secondary articulations? What's a secondary articulation? Go ahead. 
For example, it could be, it could be label, labialization like with shh, because in addition to the post-alveolar uh, contact, it's not contact, approximation that we have, or it's, it's getting very close, it's creating a fricative. So the blade of the tongue is very close to the post-alveolar region. Shh. In addition, our lips get kind of tense, and that's called labialization, hua. That's a secondary articulation, and we call it secondary because... How do we know which one's primary and which one's secondary? Because both of them are articulations. There's something happening in two different places. How do we know which one is secondary? Where's Karen? There you are, yeah. You just need one more word and you've got it. Just one more word. <laughs> closer, yeah. If the two articulators are closer for one articulation than for the other articulation, then it will be a primary articulation. And if there is a second articulation, but the articulators are a bit further apart. That's a secondary articulation. That's also a typical test question. Okay? Into your notes. So, originally for a dark L, it was also an alveolar sound. We had contact between the tip of the tongue and the alveolar ridge. Air is coming out the sides of the tongue, or at least one side. That's why I call it a lateral, right? So, we have contact at the alveolar ridge, but over time, this L after vowels developed a secondary articulation of velarization, right? Now, which is closer, the alveolar contact or the velarization? Which one is closer? At least at the beginning when we started producing, and this is what we believe happened with the development of dark Ls. So in the case that we have alveolar contact, which articulation has a closer contact between the articulators? Alveolar area or the velar area? Velar. Just at least at the beginning. Let's assume we have alveolar contact now. So, ooh, this is the way a dark L probably started out. So, Look, that's a clear L. Bill, Bill is a dark L, but I've still got alveolar contact. So we've got two articulations. We've got velarization, and we've got the tongue tip on the alveolar ridge. Comparing the two, in which one are the two articulators closer to each other? Alveolar or velar? Alveolar. Obviously alveolar, because they're touching, right? But with the velarization, is the back of the tongue necessarily touching the velum? No, not necessarily. So in that way, we know that the velarization part of it is a primary or a secondary articulation. Secondary, secondary right. That's as far, I mean, that's where I wanted to get us. Okay, the next step now is, over time, since there was velarization already marking that there was an L, did we really need that alveolar contact? Because we already hear an L sound for a dark L after a vowel, right? We already hear that ooh because of the velarization. Since we already hear it due to the velarization, do we still need that tongue tip on the alveolar ridge? 一定要吗? No, we don't need it. So over time, we stop bothering at all. So it had a primary articulation. So bill, bill, I'm not doing anything particular, in particular with the tip of my tongue. Now, in this case of this kind of dark L, which is probably the most common, which is the primary articulation? What is the primary articulation of a dark L when there's no alveolar contact? It's the velarization, right? So now it has become a velarized sound. 
even though it may not be touching directly, but it's very, very close. We can't call that kind of an L an alveolar sound anymore because there is no alveolar contact. We leave it there because the phoneme is classified as an alveolar, right? But in fact, this allophone, this is an allophone. It's a bian ti. It's, it's a tongwei yin that belongs to L. This version, it's like a banben, is no alveolar to get out. So what is the primary articulation now? Velar. Okay, it's a velar articulation. And Latifoget also mentions that, is this still a consonant? What's the definition of a consonant? What's the definition of a consonant as opposed to a vowel? How do we distinguish them? Go ahead. Obstruction. Now, for uh, do we have a lot of obstruction there? In fact, uh, in Chinese, is that a consonant or a vowel? Uh, is that a consonant or a vowel, Karen? Yeah. That's obviously a vowel, right? Now, if I say that English dark L sounds like Chinese, uh, is L more of a vowel, do you think, or a consonant? Go ahead, Wendy. It's a vowel, basically. L becomes a high back vowel. Ooh. And Latifoged mentions that in the, te in the text. So it really is, it's the second paragraph on page 69, the last sentence. Can you see it? Strictly speaking, therefore, this sound is not an alveolar consonant. We're talking about dark L, but more like some kind of what? Back vowel. All right? So please understand that about clear L and dark L. Dark L still belongs to the consonant phoneme, the approximant L. But in this form, this allophone of L actually, strictly speaking, is a kind of vowel. But this is just an allophone. It's just allophone. Just like water sounds like a D, it's voiced. But T, it's voiced. It's voiceless. Taps, your voicing. That is just an allophone, a phenomenon. So it's a surface phenomenon. The real, the real original character is it's a consonant, it's an approximant, it's alveolar. But this particular allophone is actually basically a kind of back vowel. And then we're going to continue with H. Huh? I mentioned in class before that H is often not on the table of consonants, the IPA symbols at all. Look in your book inside the back cover. Can we find H? All right. It's called glottal and a fricative, but it is neither glottal nor fricative. It's not glottal and it's not fricative. Because if it becomes fricative, it depends on where you're producing it and how much force you use. For example, um, in Beijing Mandarin, hao, hao. All right. We write it with H, but that is actually a velar fricative. But in the Taiwan version, it's hao. Hao. Do we have friction? We do have some noise, but the noise is basi <coughs> basically aspiration. That's all. The H has been ruohua. It's really been considerably weakened or this, this sound that we write with H and Tinyin. We write it with X and IPA. X is the sound of the sound. Hao, we'd write with an X. But for Hao, we can just use an H for Taiwan Mandarin, no problem, because we usually don't have that friction. So H is not really a fricative. We don't have friction. We have aspiration. And it's only glottal if you're just breathing and doing nothing else. You can call that glottal, sort of. But if you have another sound after it, for example, let's say he, ta, he, say he. 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 Where is your tongue? Where is the highest part of your tongue? He. 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 Suck in cool air, you can probably find it. He. Which part of your tongue feels cooler? Is it way in back? Way, way in back for he? Where is it? It's basically palatal, he, he, because of the e. The e sound is in the palatal area. It's high, 
and it's around the hard palate, E. So H is like a chameleon, a bien salon. It takes on the place of articulation of whatever vowel comes after it. Also probably will be in the test, write it down. Have that answer memorized and ready. So H has no fixed place of articulation at all. It completely depends on the following vowel because it basically is just blowing out air. It's just aspiration, not really a fricative. If you classify it as glottal, it's because there's no place else to put it. It does not have a set place of articulation. It takes on the place of articulation of the vowel that comes after it. And it says that H huh normally occurs only in what places in English? Look at the beginning of the last paragraph of this section on page 69. We usually only pronounce H in what position? Can we pronounce an H at the end of a syllable? How about B-E-E-H? Would that work in English? B. Do we have such a word? H cannot occur in a final position, in a syllable final position. It can't. It just doesn't happen because of the rules of phonotactics, which you should also should already have read about. So H does not occur at the end of a syllable. Now does that ring a bell? Is there a sound, a consonant in English that does not occur at the beginning of a syllable? What is it? Just sometimes does, genre. It's just very uncommon and it's only in foreign loans. But there's a, there's a sound that never occurs at the beginning of a syllable, which is ng, engma, right? That's never at the beginning of a, symbol, a syllable. In Vietnamese, they have it, but when it comes into English, it comes out as nguyen, comes out as n, because we just don't say ng at the beginning of a syllable. So, certain phonologists have suggested that ng and h can be viewed as allophones of the same phoneme. Would you agree with that? Could you accept that? Because h only occurs at the beginning of a syllable. Ng never occurs at the beginning of a syllable. If it's ng, it's at the end of a syllable. So could we put those together and say they're actually just conditioned variants of the same phoneme? They're allophones of the same phoneme? Could we do that? You don't like that. Why? Your zizhu is very good. Let's justify it, though, objectively. I agree with you totally. I don't like that. I don't like that at all. It's been tried, but there's a very good objection against it. What is it? But we can't, we can't put a ng at the beginning of a syllable, and we can't put a h at the end. So why can't we just say they belong to the same abstract phoneme? If it's at the beginning, it's naturally a h. If it's at the end, it's naturally a ng. There's no chong tu. We can't change the meaning because neither can, they can't change places. Right? Anybody think of a good reason why we should not consider them as allophones of the same phoneme? I think most of you have a zhujie, right? You have this feeling in your gut that it's not a nice idea. Doesn't, doesn't sound good. Why? Why don't you think about it over break? Let's just finish this paragraph. See if you can come up with a reason. It, actually, there is a reason, I think, in the textbook. Um, but you can get to it by thinking, probably. And it says that uh, some speakers of English also have the sound h before w, so they have the hu sound. They distinguish between which and which. I don't, but my third grade teacher tried very hard to get the whole class to say which, what, where, instead of which, what, where. She would correct us, and she would do it in a very, very elevated way. Which, what? <laughs> I still remember that. It really left an impression. Um, but I don't know if anybody ever changed their English because of something a grade school teacher told you. Maybe some people did. We didn't, I, we didn't, I don't think. Um, and as I mentioned in class before, there are three different ways to write the sound. What are they? The most common one that you learn in Taiwan is what? Not uch, by the way, h. Kai lang dian. Everybody h. Yeah, don't say uch. Everyone h. H. Very good. What is the way you learn in Taiwan? H. W, right? H, W, where, for example, whether. And the second way to do it that we mentioned in class before, and it's also in this paragraph, we know uh, a Jiangjiu way to do it. We can just add a little 
circle under the W, and that means voiceless. So it goes from voiced W to voiceless Hu. That's the second way. And the third way, we can use a separate symbol. Very good. Somebody's drawing it. And upside down, lowercase W. So, xiao xie de W, dao guo lai xie, is also hu. Now, it doesn't seem very consistent to have three different symbols, but there are various reasons that we do this. Circles are usually added when lin si fa sheng de tu ran jian bian voiceless, we just add a circle. That means ping chang ke neng bu se voiced. Lin si bian, a ping chang bu se voiceless. Lin si bian voiceless, that's usually when we use a circle. Keep that in mind, everybody, this is an important point, also maybe in a test. So if we add a little circle under it, it means this sound is usually voiced, but in this situation, like after put and play, it becomes voiceless, so we put a circle there. Say that we have a little change here. It's an allophone, usually. Usually. It doesn't have to be, but that's the way we usually use it. So that's why we have the circle. And the HW, it's just been established for so long. And the upside down W was created, I think, to make the system more dui cheng. So we have the three different symbols, but they do all mean the same. And then this last statement was the one I was referring to earlier, that in dialects where there's a distinction between hu and wu, it says it's more likely to be found only in the less common words like whether, but that is not my experience. You do hear it occasionally, sometimes facetiously, and what do you think you're doing? We will do this. What do you think you're doing? Where do you think you're going? This is a stylistic thing. But for people who have the hu, in my experience, they are consistent. And all you have to do is go listen to Mr. Tim Casey. Okay, if any of you ever have a class with Mr. Tim Casey, his hu is very consistent. 他原来是, uh, 从Michigan来的. He has a very consistent hu. And I think Bruce does too, Bruce Bagnall. 他好像也有. I'm not sure. I don't remember with Bruce. I think he does. So we have a number of native speakers of English in our, in our, uh, on our faculty who have this natively. Listen to them. They are very consistent. Okay? I used to hike with Mr. Casey. And I thought, wow, all of the hu, exactly where they belong, you really do it. So listen, you will find it. That's the end of this section. We'll take a short break. What question do you, should you think about during break? Why ng and h shouldn't really be considered allophones of the same phoneme, right? OK, break time. Anybody come up with a good theory about why it's not so good to have h and ng as allophones of the same phoneme? Jerome looks ready. <laughs> Is it because that um, if we can't possibly find any modalities between H and H? That's the answer right there. That is the answer. They're not similar enough. They don't have much at all in common. They just don't have enough in common. H has no place of articulation, so it's very hard to compare. But ng is velar. Ng is what kind of a sound? How do we classify it? It's nasal. It's a, it's a velar nasal sound. And h is aspiration. We don't have a really, <clears throat> it doesn't belong to that same classification system at all. It's voiceless. They just don't have much in common at all. And if we choose sounds as allophones, if we, if we suggest that a certain sound is an allophone of a certain phoneme, they should have something in common. We do have a little trouble here, though, because think of the phone, uh, sorry, the allophones of t. What are some of the allophones of t? And I, we probably have more allophones for t in English than for any other sound. T probably has more allophones than any other sound in English. So basically, we have voiceless aspirated comes first. That's, I would say, the base value. That's the least marked of the allophones. It's the most commonly thought of. It's the first thing we think of. When it's syllable initial, it's voiced and aspirated. I'm oh, sorry, voiceless, sorry. Voiceless and aspirated. And what's another 
allophone of t at the end of a syllable, it's usually, is it aspirated? No, it is unreleased. It's often unreleased at the end of a syllable. There's another allophone. And someone just mentioned tap if it comes between two vowels, especially when the second one is in an unstressed syllable. Then it turns into a voice sound, but it's not a D. It's just a very quick contact between the tongue tip and the alveolar ridge. Water touches and it goes very fast. And we have another one, like in button, button. We have a glottal stop. Now we could say that t and a glottal stop, do they have a lot in common? They're very different, right? So button is pretty different from top. But we still consider uh an allophone of t. Now we just said if two sounds are too dissimilar, they probably are not good candidates for being allophones of the same phoneme, right? But a glottal stop is definitely an allophone of t. How similar or how dissimilar are they? They are really quite different, right? So take and button, but, uh, button. What do they have in common? Pardon? Spelling. Spelling, ha. You know, that is really a strong argument, although Linguists in general, they tell you to ignore the written language. They say the written language is not language. Language is all about speech. The written language is just kind of arbitrary. They will tell you all kinds of reasons why you should ignore the written language. However, the written language is usually a record of what? At what point? At what point in time? probably a long time ago. Some languages have only been written down very recently. In those cases, they're probably a pretty accurate description of how the language is actually spoken, at least the phonemes. Otherwise, it's not a very well-designed system. But in more conservative spelling systems like English, it isn't Old English. We don't write the same way we wrote as, in old, as we wrote in Old English, nor in Middle English. There, a lot of changes have happened, but we have also kept a lot of things from earlier spellings. So usually, at least in the case of English, let's not try to generalize, but very often in a language, and certainly in the case of English, the spelling is often historical record. So we know from the spelling, actually, I think that's a fair argument. Because it was once pronounced water, it still is Walter in standard British. So we know that that, that really is a T, spelling. What else? What else do they have in common besides having the same spelling? Think of the differences between ng and h, and then think of the similarities between t and u. Anybody? Go ahead. A bit louder? The manner of articulation. Namely? There we go. They're both stops. What kind of stops? Going by the early classification that I told you to ignore? One is a glottal stop. One is not a glottal stop. They're both oral. They're both oral. So first of all, they're both oral. Second, they're both stops. One is voiceless. One is voice. We've got some dissimilarities. The place of articulation, she's a tata minure. <clears throat> but in fact, they do at least have in common that they are both stops and they are both oral. In addition, there's one other factor that you should be aware of. It's something that I mentioned in class before. Remember when I gave the illustration of where you sit when you get on a bus, depending on how many people are already sitting in the bus? If nobody's in the bus, where do you sit? Anywhere you want, right. And then, if you are really powerful, you do whatever you want, and other people have adjusted you. That was the, actually the illustration of the Biao Zhu. They have a kind of power. Their power is they are reckless. They don't really care about safety as much as you do. They are willing to take more risks than you are. So the Biao Zhu, they do whatever you want. Everybody else Hui Zhang Kai, is that right? Well, T is like that Biao Zhu that is always doing whatever it wants because it has so many, so many phonemes are pronounced at the alveolar place of articulation, right? How many? We could go through a lot. 
Remember when we were doing that exercise? All of the examples were alveolar sounds. Do you remember that one? T, what else? D, n, s, z. All of those are alveolar. <clears throat> so alveolar is already pretty powerful. And of all those, t is the most powerful. And t becomes a biao zu. It goes wherever it wants. Everybody else has to guai guai the sou zi, or at least more or less. L is a little bit of a because alveolar. So T does whatever it wants. So we would expect more variations and more extreme variations with T because T is belted zu. It does what it wants. Everybody else with on kai. This is an important principle. And it's also very basic, uh, a very, very basic principle about how power works. When you have power, you do what you want. OK? So that's what T does. However, there are still things in common. We're, we're going to try to finish up now. This part that they have in the coming section, overlapping gestures, including the illustration in figure 3.6, this is new in this edition. I'll just point that out. It's something added. Many of the things are kept from the other editions, and they needed to keep the book fairly short. I'm sure that Professor Johnson was tempted to put all kinds of things in here. He has so much to offer. But he had to keep the, sh the book manageable at a manageable length. So this is something new. He thought that this was pretty important. Um, Let's have our next reader, please. Um, I'm Lindsay. The first paragraph of Overlapping Gestures. Good. Everyone's got the title now. Overlapping Gestures. <laughs> because language is not produced like beads on a string. We don't just produce one sound very completely and precisely, then move on to the next sound. Because speech comes out in a stream, gestures are going to influence each other, be affected by each other, and overlap. So while I'm trying to make an E, I'm also getting ready to make an N, so that's going to affect how I make the E. That's what this is about. Go ahead. All the sounds we have been considering involve movements of the articulators. They are often described in terms of the articulatory positions that characterize these movements. These. These Good. movements. But rather than thinking in terms of static positions, mm -hmm. thinking in. Thinking in. Uh uh. You're saying thinking. 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 Go on, king. Thinking. Right. In, uh, in terms of static. Oh, not in. Thinking in. Thinking in. <laughs> we have an ung and an un, so you have to you have to be pretty limber. You have to be a little a bit of an acrobat. Thinking in. Thinking in. 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 So try to put the ng in front of the i because it's linked. It's a little hard because we don't do that in English in theory, but in practice we do. Thinking in. Thinking in. You're saying thinking. Thinking. It's always in guy the ing. Thinking in. Thinking in. <laughs> in. in. Write that down. Practice that. Your pronunciation is beautiful, but it's a good defang niang kai zui. First of all, linking. And finally, zui wei, the velar gen al velar niang zui. Okay, anyway, this in guys the thinking. Thinking, remember a long time ago when, um, uh, when we had a classmate from the US and she said, thinking, she started giggling because it's too casual. When we're reading from a textbook, if you use a casual pronunciation, it sounds out of place. So I think it doesn't say out zui, even though we do say thinking. For example, what are you doing there? You're doing nothing at all. I'm thinking, I'm thinking. But not when you're reading a textbook. It will sound really funny. We will be jarred. So thinking in. Thinking in. Yeah, no matter what. In terms of static positions, we should really consider each sound as a movement. This makes it easier to understand the overlapping of consonant and vowel gestures in words such as beep, dip, bib, bib, bib. OK, make sure you understand the words, although it's not really essential um, because we're just talking about sound. But bibs the way do, xiao peng yong yong the way do. And did, you know, gig, this is it's a biao yan de, yi ge ji hui. We have a gig tonight at, uh, at Sappho's, yi ge jiu ba, OK? We have a gig, just so myo ge biao yan de yi ge chang he, OK? Mentioned earlier in this chapter, as we noted in the first word, bib. As. OK, as. remember that's another thing. You learned us in school. We often say us, but especially at the beginning of a sentence, it's quite emphatic. 
So we should use the citation form rather than the reduced form. So as, uh, for example, uh, he's as good as gold, as good as gold, 可以. But as we already noted, as 他一定会比较重, all right? As we noted in the first word, bib, the tongue tip is... The? The? The. 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 The tongue tip is behind the lower front teeth throughout the word. Throughout the word. Thru throughout the word. Let's try it. Bib, the tongue tip is behind the lower teeth. Say bib and notice where the tip of your tongue is. Where are you putting it? Bib. Where is the tip of your tongue? Bib. Bib. Where is your tongue tip? Found that nadi. Where is your tongue when where is the tip of your tongue when you're saying bib? Bib. It says in the book. It's usually behind the lower teeth. Yours probably is in that place. It's hard to make this sound correctly unless you put it there. So we're going to start paying attention now to what you're doing with articulators when we're not using them right in the moment. So for bib, we've got a vowel. Vowel, we don't have an obstruction, right? But we have to put our articulator somewhere. So it's going to be affected by b, both at the beginning and the end. Usually the tongue is behind the lower front teeth. Okay. In, in the second word, did, the tip of the tongue goes up for the first uh, and remains and, and remains close to the alveolar ridge <coughs> during the vowel so that it is ready for the second uh. Good. Remains. Remains. Everyone remains. Remains. Mark this word in your notes because most of you will say remains or remains. Should be remains. Try it again. Remains. Remains. Good. Okay. In the third word, geek, the back of the tongue is raised. Tongue. Tongue. This is the same problem. So this is systematic. Just a suede the ng. You have to be careful. Okay. For the first g, and it remains near the soft palate during the vowel. Soft. Soft. Okay, everyone. Soft. Soft. Soft palate. Ah, good. Very good. On soft palate mm -hmm. during the vowel. Mm -hmm. In all these cases. Mm -hmm. In all. In. Hold me. These are These. 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 Right. Cases. 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 Mm, Meo zila. Cases. Cases. Yeah, Cases. like in Chinese. Xiao case. Cases. Your, your pronunciation in Chinese is absolutely perfect. Xiao case. But when you're reading English, you often say cas. Which is really funny. When you're speaking Mandarin, case, the fine si, si quan si mei is perfect. Case, xiao case, xiao case yi zhuang. It's perfect. But when you're reading English, you often say cas. Isn't that funny? Isn't that funny? Can you explain that? I mean, let's just take a second. Can you explain that? Why do you say it perfect when you're speaking Chinese? Case is already a Chinese word. And you say it with perfect English pronunciation when you're speaking Chinese. But when you are reading English, then it's not correct. Can anyone explain that? Maybe it's because that we just pronounce the case uh, individually. And when we, when we speak English, we always pronounce, we always, uh, pronounce many, many words. So sometimes we will, we will miss something. And, uh, OK, so I think what, what Stanley is suggesting is when you're reading, you're following some habits and some rules. So, in Taiwan English, a often gets pronounced as a or a. So you're just following the rule of Taiwan English that a is pronounced a or a. But xiao case came in as a wai lai yu. It just jumped in all by itself. Is that what you're suggesting? So you heard it correctly and you say it correctly. But when you're reading English, you're putting it in the system of Taiwan English. Do you think that makes sense? If you have another idea, let me know. Because I think this is very interesting. The wai lai yu is perfect, but when you're reading English, it's wrong. Okay, go on. Case. Case. Mm -hmm. The gestures for the vowels and consonants overlap. All right, so we have overlapping, chong die. They're going to affect each other. The place of articulation is going to change a bit. We already noted where our tongue tip is when we say bib. Let's try did. Everyone, where's your tongue when you say did? Did. Where's your tongue now throughout the word? For the vowel especially, where's your tongue? Did, did. Is it behind your lower teeth, like for bib? 
Did now where is it? Closer to the alveolar ridge because you're getting ready. You just finished a duh, it happens to be there. And you have another duh anyway. So why do you want to leave the alveolar ridge? We try to do things with the least effort possible. That's just the way we do things. It's not bad. It's bad if we're tolan and we do a lousy job. But it's good if it helps us be more efficient and we can still make ourselves understood clearly. So that's for did. And how about for gig? Where is your vowel in gig? Where, where, sorry, where is your tongue during the vowel in gig? Say i by itself, i, and then say gig and compare. We also have what allophonic rule here with gig? Is the vowel in gig exactly the same vowel as in did and bib? Because? Because we have velar raising, right? In addition, we've got more of an e, an e sound than an i sound because of velar raising. In addition, that final velar sound is doing what to your tongue? And also the beginning velar sound, too. It's the same as with did. You don't want to stray too far from where you're going. So, we follow the rule of least amount of effort, right? Taking, making the least, least amount of effort that we can to still make the sound clear so it doesn't go too far from the velar area, right? Very good. Um, I'm going to summarize a bit to save time. We do the same thing with the lips, with gestures of the lips. When we say w, lip rounding is very important. There's a tendency for gestures to overlap with those for adjacent sounds. All right, we've already said that a number of times. So stops are slightly rounded when they in, occur in clusters in which w is the second element. Now we remember we, we were talking about this to talk about voicelessness, right? So w is originally voiced or voiceless? Originally voiced, but after a voiceless stop or fricative, it's usually voiceless. So that's one thing, it's voiceless, but in addition, that W is going to affect what comes before it as well. The W is being affected by the T because the T is voiceless. But the T is also being affected by the W in what, in what way? The T will be more, more rounded, right? Because the W is rounded, the T is going to be more rounded. When we say the T, we're already getting ready for the W. And this always reminds me a story of my, my Gong Gong. He was very, very careful about getting things done on time. So anybody who's late would irritate him terribly. And if he was, the, the story in the family was, 明天客人要来,今天先把茶泡好. That's what they said about my Gong Gong. Yeah, so, 就是明天要来的客人,今天先把茶泡好. So that's what we're doing. We're behaving like my Gong Gong here. We know the W is coming, so we rounding. T is rounding. So say our example word twice, everyone, twice. Now, stop yourself when you're saying the T and look at your, feel what your lips are doing. Look at mine. You can see mine. Twice. I've already rounded it before I've even made the T. That's what we're talking about here when we're talking about overlapping gestures. This is called anticipatory assimilation. Anticipatory. Anticipate. That means you're guessing what's going to happen. So this is anticipatory assimilation. Lip rounded the W lip rounding. Anticipatory assimilation. There's another kind, and it's called perseverative. Perseverative. That comes from persevere. Persevere is a Okay, we'll find an example of perseverative assimilation in English as well, I think. Um, but usually English uses anticipatory assimilation. Usually we're getting ready for something happening in the future rather than preserving something happening in the past. But we do that as well. Um, 
Okay, let's uh, look at the rest of the paragraph. So another sound that has some lip rounding besides W is what? R. R. Yes, your lip rounding. And that's uh, quite a difference from the Chinese R and R. Okay, look at, look at my mouth so you can see it. R. R. Now that's a more Beijing pronunciation. Sometimes you have no R at all in Taiwan. Is that right? R. Do you hear people say R? A lot of time the R is completely gone from Taiwan English. In addition, Right? And it's not just R. It also is You hear people saying the funniest things. Taiwan English, Taiwan Mandarin is but you will often hear people say, er. If you haven't heard it, listen. You will often hear er. It's really funny. When I hear it, I feel embarrassed. I think, don't you know better? There's no R there. It sounds like they're trying to, they're trying to show off and trying to sound more Beijing or something. I don't know the reason, but it's really common. Not everybody does it. And the people who do it don't do it all the time. But it's really frequent. You do hear it. So um, that's the case. Anyway. Uh, with with er in Mandarin, um, we have no rounding there. So look, er zi, er qie. Do you see any any rounding? Try it yourself. Are you rounding to make those sounds? Er zi, er qie, er er. Do you have any lip rounding? No. But we do have lip rounding in English. So look at my mouth now. Really, row, raw, red. Do you see lip rounding? Yeah. And it's something that most of us are not really aware of. I have this, I've had this uh, debate with another pronunciation teacher. He insists that it's not part of R to have lip rounding. But try to say a word without lip rounding, which was his argument. OK, look at my mouth. Really? You're not going there? Really? <laughs> really? There is almost always some lip rounding. So R inherently is rounded. Keep that in mind, whatever this guy says. OK, he's not right. <laughs> no names mentioned, all right. Nobody in Taiwan, don't worry. All right, so um, this is going to affect what comes before it. So for example, with the word shu, yi ke shu, how do we say that? Yi ke shu, zhang ye zhen zhong, in English. Tree, look at my mouth. Tree, tree. Do I have rounding for the T? Yeah, so W and R will probably add rounding to what comes before it. And that's called an anticipatory assimilation. Very good. Okay, the other one's called perseverative. Perseverative. Well, my guanzi. I won't give you an example yet, but there are a few examples of perseverative assimilation in English. And the next paragraph is mainly about different articulations as being movements towards certain targets. Now, when you are, when you are doing target practice in archery, do you always hit the target? Do you always hit the target? No. And we don't, we don't do it in speech either. And it's not just because we have a bad aim. It's because we want to be as economic as possible in our gestures. 就是希望很经济, so in order to reduce the amount of effort we're expending, we will we'll take shortcuts. So we will aim for targets, but we also, in addition to the target we're aiming for, in E, for example, or in I, we have to think of the target of the consonant after it. So we're going to adjust everything in terms of what's coming. That's the, that's the main point of this. Mm. All right, let's look at the gesture at these drawings now in figure 3.6 that I mentioned. We're new in this edition on page 71. And uh, it says that the data here are traces of the vocal tract during in a variety of vowel contexts in which context in which language? in French. So these are not for English, these are for French. And then he's going to point out what is different for different vowels that come after these sounds. 
Uh, I think it's mostly after. And if you look closely, we're in the middle now of the last paragraph on page 70, that really long one. You can see that tongue positions during B for the French vowels E, U, and A, and the umlaut U, which is U. So the letter Y is the symbol for U, same as for Mandarin, U. And you will see that the tongue position varies quite a bit for B. Everybody see B now in figure 3.6? Right? So you can see that the jaw, the lips, do they have a lot of lines? Or are they mostly in the same place compared to the tongue? To make the vowels, the tongue is in many different places. It's affecting the B in terms of the tongue position. Okay, you're shaking your heads, that's a good sign. So, your jaw, your lips, in the middle of the book, no matter what you're talking about, in the front of it, or maybe in the front of it, the middle of the mouth and the middle of the mouth, it's the same. It's the same. It's the same. So, we don't see a lot of fuzzy lines. But what about the drawings of the tongue? Those are drawings of the positions of the different vowels made after B, I believe. Adjacent to, it could be before or after. Adjacent means being just a, 是邻居了，是旁边的。So it could be either before or after. Can you see all those different lines for the position of the tongue for b? Do you see it? So they wrote, they drew all kinds of different positions of the tongue. We've got many, many variations and positions of the tongue during b. 这是念 b 的时候，旁边有不同的母音的时候，那个 b 本身。嘴唇下颚没有什么动，没有什么变化。可是舌头的位置会换很，会有很多不同的位置。Is that clear? All right. So this is where these are really pictures of what what the articulatory organs are doing during b. 这是念子音的时候。可是因为受到母音的影响，舌头的位置很多不同的啊，下颚嘴唇不大会变。How about for d? Do we have a lot of differences in the lips and in the jaw? For d, we have some differences in the lips, right? The lips, lips are getting a little fuzzier here. Ah ho, uh, how about how about the t and the jaw is also quite stable, but the jaw is also quite stable, much like b. How about the tongue? Do we have as much variation with the with uh, d in the uh, in the context of different vowels as we do for b? 没有那么多的变化 ，so that means that 的比较会把舌头固定住一点。这个舌头就在念不同的母音，在接近的的时候，或者念的的时候，那个舌头的位置其实都不会变太多。And what's the reason for that? Because to make a 的再怎么样 ，what do we have to do with our tongue? We have to put the tongue tip on the alveolar ridge or the teeth. In French and the Romance languages, the alveolar sounds of English, their counterparts in the Romance languages are often dental. So, Fawen, Itali, Wen, Deng Deng, Xiban Ya Wen, 大部分都是齿音，不是不像英文的那个 alveolar 比较多，就像中文，中文也是 dental 的呈现比较多，对不对 ？So the tongue has to be on the alveolar ridge or partly on the teeth as well. So there's not much you can do with the tongue. The different vowels are not going to change it as much because it's got something it absolutely has to do. This is 无论如何要做到的 But when you're making a B, is there anything special you absolutely have to do with the tongue? 你在念 B 的时候 ，tongue 有没有一定要执行的任务？有没有？没有 So that's why we have so much flexibility. And then how about for G? How about for G? Do we have as much variation as we do for B? No. Do we have as little variation as we do for d? No. We've got something in between. 也有一些 variation. 可是 g 跟 d 一样，舌头再怎么样是要碰到。But with g, we do have some variation because what? Remember car and key. Car, key. What's the difference? Is the k equally velar velar in both those examples? Car key, car key. 
Is the k in those two words equally velar? No, it's more back for car and more front for key, right? So we do see some variation with g. It's velar and we can adjust So that's why we see some variation in the tongue position. We see lots with b, we don't have to do anything with the tongue, so it does what it wants. With d, it's more固定的。那个 d 那个前后的调整的那个空间那个幅度并不大。Okay, so do you all understand these drawings now? These are for French, but it applies, I assume, for many other languages as well. So we're on the last paragraph on page 71. Co-articulation between sounds will always result in the positions of some parts of the vocal tract being influenced quite a lot, whereas others will not be so much affected by neighboring targets. That's an important sentence. Now, I may give you the sentence in a test and ask you to explain it. 这句话你要说明为什么 ？Why are some, why can some be influenced a lot, and why are others not easily influenced? They can't be influenced a lot. 这句话你要说明为什么 ？And you could give the example of these three sounds. With d, you don't have much 幅度 you don't have much space, much room, wiggle room to move the tongue position, to change the tongue position. With b, you do. With g, you have some, but not as much as with b. Okay. 这个很可能啊，考试会出现这样的句子。Okay, and it also depends on the interval between two sounds. So, uh, for this sound, watch the lip rounding in the consonant. Everybody, pay attention. Ku. Have I rounded even before I've said the k? Ku, 有没有 ？Ku 还没有那个 k 都还没有念出来，已经有 rounding。k 本身需要 rounding 吗？ No, so that u is right after it. So it has a good impact. Let's look at another possibility. How about clue? We put an l between the u and the l. Is l rounded? Is l rounded? No. So you think that 中间夹一个没有圆唇的一个音的话，会不会使那个 k 怎么样？ Rounding 少一点，会不会？ So watch my comparison of the two. Clue, clue. Clue, clue. Do you see less rounding for clue? But is there still rounding? Yes, there is. There's less rounding, but there is still rounding. So, 中间加一个没有 rounding 的音，还是会有影响，可是可能会减少一些。Now, how about if we put a word boundary between the two? 是一个字跟一个字之间的那个界限。So, look at the example. We're at the bottom of seventy-one. Watch again. This one is sack lu. That means 把鹿炒鱿鱼了的意思。炒炒鹿的鹿的鱿鱼的意思。So watch, coo, clue, sack, lu, coo, clue, sack. Do I have much rounding? No, I may have a little, but not much. If I didn't have u coming, sack, I may have even less less rounding. So sack, look, sack, I'm still getting ready. Cause it'll be 更少，对不对 ？Okay. So again, I'll compare the three. Watch. Ku, clue, sack, sack, lu, sack, lu. 还是有一点 rounding， 可是蛮少的。Doesn't necessarily have to have rounding.、Um, how about in tackle lu? The lip rounding for the u may start in the k, which is separated by two segments and a word boundary. Top of seventy-two. Everybody watch. Sack lu, sack. Not too much rounding, but there may be a little bit. So ku 的有一点圆的时候。Two segments plus a word boundary. You 可能还是有一点影响，可能会有点 rounding. So we have no simple relationship between this description of a language in terms of phonemes and the description of utterances in terms of gestural targets. So you need a targets. You 要提供一个非常准确，就是绝对不会有错误的，不会有偏离的地方的一个 description. 我们做得到吗 ？No, because there are too many influencing factors in speech. 左右。那个旁边的那些音影响很难预测 ，so we are not able to make a perfect description of phonemes in terms of gestural targets. We can describe their targets, but the actual the actual pronunciation is going to show a lot of differences.、Um, so we can explain the differences between different allophones of a phoneme in terms of targets and overlapping gestures. 你的目的，我们先讲好。可是重叠的这些
，旁边的 in 那个也要考虑进去。Okay. So he talks about ten, the n and tenth, which we've already talked about. Um, the last part of the paragraph, it talks about the t and the a question, and we've already really covered that earlier, so we don't need to go about them. But、uh, go back to that. However, we want to talk about intrinsic allophones and extrinsic allophones. Basically, what they're saying is the difference between ka and ku. We would call an intrinsic allophone. Because in 再怎么样，后面的母音就是会影响你发科的地方。E 会前面一点 ，R 会后面一点。However, if it's really, if it's really a bit different, like all those different allophones of t, like the unreleased stop at the end of a syllable, like the tap, and also like the glottal stop, we call those extrinsic allophones. 有时那个界限不是非常清楚 ，but the things that are 比较，好像内建的那种。而且比较不会想到的那那些就叫 intrinsic key and ka, and then the ones where you can hear they're quite different and they have a very clear rule, those are extrinsic allophones. And to summarize, gestural targets are units that can be used in descriptions of how a speaker produces utterances. Phonemes are more abstract units that can be used in descriptions of languages to show how words contrast with one another. Did we all follow that? No. Let's see if we can understand it. So, gestural targets are units that can be used in descriptions of how a speaker produces utterances. 我们要描述一个人讲话，他的发音器官会占有什么样的一个位置的时候，我们可以用 targets 来做一个描述的一个基础。Phonemes are more abstract units that can be used in descriptions of languages. To show how words contrast with one another. If we're talking about phonemes, 纯粹讲 phonemes 的话，我们是讲这个音跟那个音可以区别不同的意思。That's 蛮抽象、蛮理论的。But when we're talking about gestural targets, 那个可以描述你实际，你这个动作的 motivation 是什么。所以在真正的在描述真正的讲话的时候，我们可以用 gestural target 作为一个基础来描述实际讲话。那个舌头啊，还有其他的器官，它采取的那些位置，或者它，嗯，它朝向的那些目标 ，Is that clear or not? Okay, good. You're nodding, and that's a good sign. And、um, virtually all gestures for neighboring sounds overlap. In speech, almost all sounds overlap with each other somehow. Differences in the timing of one gesture with respect to another. So timing is 另外一个很重要的考虑。一个是左右邻居的那些音会影响你现在针对的那个音。同时 ，timing 也是很重要。你时间停的越久，就是互相的影响越少。So timing is also important. And the next section provides a number of additional examples. So next time you are going to hand in your handwritten copies of these rules, right? So what we will do, since we didn't read them in class, be ready to read your rules out loud. I will probably summarize the little explanatory bits between the rules. So I think we're pretty much on time, on target. Plus, there's a little section on diacritics. We'll cover that in class next time. And the test is on the 28th, right? 26th. We've got exercises. We'll go over the exercises for this chapter. In class, and also you need to hand in your plot assignment. Next time we finish up this chapter, except for the exercises. Are we okay? Check on the syllabus; it's up to date now, up till December fifth. Check on Facebook because stuff comes up. There's an interesting link about an autistic boy. It's they made it into an animated video. When this boy hears sounds, he Suffers from overstimulation. 有些人是对声音是敏感到，他听了好像是 ，it's like it's like a rocket attack. You know, it's like a mortar attack on him when all kinds of different sounds come at him. And the the video exaggerates these sounds for people who are not so sensitive. So you can feel a little bit what it's like to be an autistic child who's very sensitive to sound. You hear a little sound, and it just makes you 完全受不了 You have to get away from it. Autistic children are often very also also 
are also often very sensitive to touch. So you want to hug them and try to comfort them, but they can't take it. It's just like sound. It's too much sti stimulation. It's just like beating on somebody. They can't stand it. So I think that's a really interesting exercise because in phonetics, we're trying to develop sensitivity to sounds. That's really our main goal here. But some kids are already so sensitive to sounds, they cannot live comfortably in this world of noise that we all live in more or less comfortably. So that's an interesting video on Facebook, so pay a visit to NTU Phonetics. Any questions? We basically finished the chapter, except for the rules, which we'll cover on Wednesday. Any questions? Okay, we'll see you on Wednesday.